Good morning and welcome. My name is Mary Robertson. I am the Director of Communications and Marketing for the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. I am filling in this morning on behalf of my colleague Nathan Sorensen, who is our Strategic Information Technology Procurement Officer. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on MEC's contract with Novell featuring Managing File Madness. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This call is being recorded so that we can make it available online. In addition, we will email you the slides. To ensure everyone can hear, we have muted the lines. We also encourage you to ask lots of questions by using the chat feature located on the left-hand portion of your screen. In the event we cannot answer all the questions in the time allotted, we will respond after this event. Finally, at the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive a brief survey. Please be sure to give us your feedback so that we can continue to improve our webinar series. Before turning the controls over to our guest presenter from Novell, I'd like to briefly introduce you to the Midwestern Higher Education Compact and how we arrived at this contract with Novell, as well as some information resources available to you regarding this contract. To help you understand our contracting authority and why MEC is involved with these technology contracts, it is best to have a better understanding about our organization. We are an interstate compact charged with advancing Midwestern higher education through interstate cooperation and resource sharing. The Midwestern Higher Education Compact is one of four regional higher education compacts in the United States, and each have their own niche for addressing issues and advocating for higher education. Often referred to as MEC or MHEC, our niche was rooted in cost savings programs created by and supported by stakeholders from our 12 Midwestern states of Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. The compact is governed by a 60-member board, the commission, which is made up of governor's designees, legislative and higher education leaders, essentially trying to help students get into and matriculate through college as well. We are also a source in policy where we attempt to help decision makers such as governors, legislators, and higher education leaders in our member states make more informed decisions and provide them with information. MEC has agreements in place to extend our technology's cost savings programs to the Southern Regional Educational Board and to the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, SREB, and WICHE. Currently, we have no agreements with the New England Board of Higher Education, or NEBI, and as the map shows, there are three states not covered by any of the compacts, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. These states currently are not members of any compact. What a compact is, well, it is really a contract amongst the states. This legislation that was passed in each member state makes us an instrumentality of state government in 12 member states. Similar, similarly, the other compacts have been statutorily created. What makes the compact unique to the higher education community is its broad contracting authority created in each of its member states. The compact is not a group purchasing organization. The compact is a means for stakeholders in the 12 member states to collaborate on identifying regional issues and committing resources to leverage a solution through the compact's statutory authority. We are very selective in the types of contracts that we pursue. We try to identify those areas that we can bring value in, and as a result, it will be something that an individual institution may not be able to replicate on its own. But because we are working together across state lines, regionally, and now nationally, we can bring value that wouldn't have otherwise been there. The Novell MEC Higher Education Collaborative is a sole source agreement between Novell and MEC for the joint purposes of making Novell products, services, and training more accessible and affordable to MEC member states. The contract was initially negotiated in 2002 and is automatically extended on an annual basis by agreement between both MEC and Novell. All higher education institutions in the MEC 12 state region using Novell academic licenses are eligible for the Novell MEC discount. For K through 12 entities, check with your Novell account manager to determine your eligibility to use the Novell MEC discount. To receive the discounts, join or renew in four easy steps. I'll quickly show you these steps, easy steps to join or renew, which can be done by selecting software from the top toolbar of MEC's e-commerce website, mectech.org. You can click on the drop-down menu at left or click on the Novell logo 
or go to the, to go to the Novell contract page. Once on the Novell page, you will be able to find contract highlights, the contract terms, specific Novell contact information, and on the right-hand side under contract eligibility, you will find clickable links for each of the eligible parties. To join or renew, simply follow the steps 1 through 4 in the left-hand toolbar of the Novell MEC Collaborative Pages, or simply click the Proceed to Next Step at the bottom of each page. Here's step 1. Step 2. Please note in step 2 you will need to complete the Novell MEC Higher Education Collaborative Worksheet. And in step 3, Novell contact forms. And finally, any contacts you would like for us to keep in touch with periodically must be submitted in Step 4. Please don't hesitate to contact our staff. You will see Nathan's contact information. As well, we've included our legal counsel should you have any direct questions for Rob. Now on to today's special presenter. Joe Martin is Sales and Engineer and North America Collaboration Solution Principal at Novell. Joe? All right. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, welcome, everyone. I appreciate you uh, taking the time out today to uh, find out about some of the uh, solutions that we've got here at Novell um, that can really help you just get a, a handle on all the files that you have in your infrastructure, regardless of whether you're a Microsoft environment or a Novell environment. Um, we've got several different components that are part of our solution suite, if you will. And I'm going to go ahead and at least discuss you know, a couple of them today, a couple of problems that uh, the solutions actually help solve. And you'll also get to see a, a short demonstration uh, once we get through all this. Now I do have a few slides here. Uh, probably I'm going to blow through a couple of these guys because again, I, I really like to actually show everything working um, instead of just being this abstract presentation. So. Uh, we'll, we'll skip through a couple of these just for, for time's sake. But really, the reason why that there is a, uh, a need for these types of uh, solutions is the fact that there's just this sheer quantity of data that is out there, and especially in academic environments. Um, even if you implement quotas for, for your students, at the end of the day when you have you know, thousands, tens of thousands in some cases of users essentially in your environment, you're still going to have a great amount of data. And so, you know, it's an interesting statistic that's out there that actually Intel put together shows that sort of from, from the dawn of the computing area all the way to 2003 is that entire time was needed to create five exabytes of data. I think we've got what gigabytes, ter uh, terabytes, petabytes. I think X is after that. Um, now we actually see that happen in just two days. That's just how much data is being created. Uh, by everyone you know, worldwide, regardless of really the industry when you add it all up. And in fact, this was a, a paper that was written a couple of years ago, so you can see that uh, by those estimations, actually by next year, uh, we're going to be up to 8 zettabytes. I'm not sure what a zettabyte is, I just want a lot of zeros. I mean, and then that's really what this all boils down to, is just the sheer quantity that's out there. When you look at some that's graphically, again, that really helps to drive the point home of how this is all accelerating over just the, the past couple of years. So as, as time goes on, um, you're going to see more and more of that. So if you look at the data that's out there, it really boils down to kind of two different areas. You've got what we call structured data. So that's going to be you know, what's out there, your different databases, Oracle, Microsoft SQL, and all the other ones. And you have all the other data, what we call unstructured. So really those are your actual files, stuff that's not in a database. And when you look at it, the bulk of the data that's out there in most environments really is unstructured. No matter how large of a database you may have, that's still just one small piece of the pie. And so when we look at this, we've got problems with that unstructured data as far as how do you manage it, you know, how much of that is, is data that hasn't been used in a long time, um, how much is maybe used but not very often, things like that, um, or maybe you don't even have any insight at all on that information. And so we can definitely help with that. The other thing I wanted to, to quickly mention before we start diving a little more into the problems is that you know, not only is there this massive amount of data that's out there, but you may have uh, your students, faculty, staff coming to you saying, hey, I want to be able to access this even if I'm not on campus. You know, no matter where I am, whatever device I'm using, 
on the one axis. And we've actually got a solution for that that we'll be going into uh, more detail on Friday. So for those of you on here, if you haven't signed up for Friday's presentation, definitely encourage you. We're talking about Filer and some of the other mobility solutions. But that just plays right into this. So it's like, okay, great. I can give you even more ways to access your data, more ways to create data, make this problem even larger. Now how do I go ahead and just manage this? And again, we're able to do that, to allow you to basically find the data that's out there, we allow you to govern that data, and then you also have the ability to relocate data, especially stuff that hasn't been used in, in a long time. So let's talk about some of the specific problems though, and then how the different pieces of our solution are able to help with that. The first thing that I bring up is just unauthorized access. Right? So you may have found out that a student gained access to uh, maybe some teacher's personal files. You want to know, well, how did that happen? Where are they getting those rights from? You know, how do we go ahead and, and, and fix that and uh, prevent that from, from happening again? Right? Um, you may even have extremely sensitive data, so it may not just be lesson plans or things like that, but it could be um, in the K-12 through world with uh, a special education plans, those IEPs. Um, it could also be information that uh, you know the back office has a registrar's office in a uh, in a university. You know things that you again you have to maintain tight controls over. Let's find out who can access this information. Let's verify that everything's okay before we find out about a problem. But of course, if you've discovered that there has been a breach and there's a problem, let's see where that's coming from. Um, and then the other, you know, another piece too, just to consider. There's many different problems that that you could look at trying to get a handle on. Um, but it's just all that growth of that data. So you know those charts and graphs from the the first couple of slides here, uh, the information that Intel put out about network growth. You know how do you actually look at that and see where the files are being stored and things like that? How do we get some insight on that information so that you don't just keep adding storage, you know, at, at will, but rather you can be a little more smart about it. Um, and make sure that if you're going to increase storage, it's because it really needs to happen, and it's not just because someone wants to save their, you know, summer vacation photos in their home directory. And so with that, we've got something called Novell File Reporter. It's one piece of our sort of three-prong approach to managing files. Um, with Novell File Reporter, we're able to go out and get that insight. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a Novell environment or a Microsoft environment. We can go ahead and do that. Um, extremely easily. It's a web-based uh, tool. You'll actually get to see that when I get into the demonstration portion here in a little bit. Um, and very easy to go ahead and build reports. Very easy to see exactly what's going on uh, in the environment. And you know some of the real important parts too. Again, are the permissions things. I really like to bring up the permissions report because you know there are a lot of solutions that that will say, hey, we can give you some insight to your file systems. Even uh, you know among our our solutions, for those of you on the phone that may be using Netware or using Novell Open Enterprise Server, um, there's a tool that allows you to go on a server by server basis and take a look at you know some of the content on there. But to really get a comprehensive view of all the servers in your environment. Um, especially, you know, the, the larger academic institutions could have tens or even hundreds of, of file servers. That's where File Reporter can can really be advantageous. So we go above and beyond what's there for the other type of data. But then, when it comes to these permissions reports, so the security information that I've referenced, that's something where we definitely really excel on, and that goes above and beyond just finding out, you know, how many MP3s are in the environment. So you could easily, from a security perspective, say, I'm going to pick, pick a particular user, show me every single folder this user can access. Or I could say, hey, I know there's this particular folder out there that's got some information. Maybe it's, the, uh, um, it's, it's with student aid, and so it's got finance information in there. And I want to know everybody that can access it. And again, we're going to show you who's been directly assigned rights, or if it's coming from a group, things like that. Um, you know, We'll give you basically all that insight of, how they're getting those rights. So it's not just knowing that they can access it, but knowing where it's coming from so you can actually go then and remediate that. Okay. So that at least is, is some of the, the initial stuff as far as finding out what's there. Right? So you know there I mentioned a few problems and hey the other's a good reporting solution. But at the end of the day we really need to be able to take action. Right? It's not not enough to just know what's there, but let's go ahead and fix problems that I find now and also go ahead and prevent problems from happening in the future. 
And so, you know, some things along those lines here, like, you know, talk about identity management systems in this particular slide. You know, many of you may have some sort of identity management solution, whether it be, you know, what you use Novell Identity Manager, which is not an IQ. Maybe you've got Oracle, possibly even Microsoft. There's a number of different uh, providers of that. But all that does is manage your identities and all those connected systems, right? So, you know, I can make sure that Active Directory users are synced with eDirectory or synced with GroupWise or Exchange or synced with uh, maybe databases that needed access, maybe an avoid telephony system, student management systems, you name it. Um, we, you know, these different uh, identity management systems can go ahead and make sure the same username and password works across all of them. But what about the file system? You know, how do we extend that to the next level to say, you know, I create a student in the student management system, which will provision all this other access, but I want the home directory to be there. Uh, if this student, you know, goes from middle school to high school, how do I move that home directory with it? Because the IDM system is going to go ahead and move that user within AD, but how do I go ahead and move that home directory, right? How do I do all these things so that the storage area isn't left behind? Um, just because uh, identities are being managed. And since I just mentioned home directories, you know, what do we do in the fall when you have a bunch of students coming in and uh, they're, they're new to the district or they've, you know, they're freshmen at uh, college and you need to add all these home directories that are out there, provision them in a hurry, you can't do this manually, um, and then actually, like I said, manage them fully so it's not just creating them, moving them around, and even more importantly, what happens when these students, you know, graduate or otherwise leave uh, the, the university or leave the district? How do I clean that up? Which, you know, when I talk to a lot of customers about this and say, how are you handling that? Uh, and they'll come back and say, well, I do that manually right now, or I've written a, a custom script to do that. So, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually automate that, uh, that type of process? All right, so let's talk about how we can do that here, uh, again, using an Novell solution. Because at the end of the day, you know, Microsoft Novell is both being supported, so you see both of those in, in this uh, diagram here. And we've got that disconnect to, to illustrate identities are on one side, they may be managed by uh, some sort of automated system. You've got your file systems on the other side, whether it be Netware, OES, Windows Server, NAS devices. So let's bridge that gap and bring those two environments together. And we do that easily with Novell Storage Manager. So that's in the next component of our uh, solution suite. So with Storage Manager, we basically look for those changes occurring in the directory. Again, we don't care if it's Active Directory or eDirectory. When we see those changes occur, we'll then go through and take action. So when users are created, they're deleted, moved, group membership changes, things like that, we'll basically look and say, hey, do we have a policy that says that we need to do something? And if we do, then we go ahead and, and make that change. So that's a real important thing. It's all policy-based, just as uh, you may see a lot of the identity stuff is policy-driven. Uh, when we do it from a storage perspective, it's the same story, which really makes it easy then to go in and uh, say, you know, I want to have students' home directories and uh, being treated one way, but I want faculty and staff being treated another way. So if it's all policy driven, I just associate that policy with the right group or the right container uh, within AD or within E directory. So very easy then to, like I say, go ahead and automate all that file system management that, uh, that a lot of times just doesn't happen. So, you know, again, policies, I already talked about that, kind of skipped past this slide a little bit here, which is just kind of reiterating how important the policies are. So at the end of the day, so many different things are involved with the whole life cycle of storage in an environment. You know, I've talked about provisioning essentially and deprovisioning. With everything that happens within that, moving it around, uh, managing quotas, which we can do very easily, uh, and actually move that even out of IT's hands if you want, and allow, you know, individual uh, department heads to do it, you know, the math department, science department, they could actually manage that if you wanted to. Um, and then another thing that's noted on here, file grooming. So I don't want to touch on everything that's in here, but, you know, if you want to say, you know what, unless you sign up for a uh, music class, you should not have MP3s in your home directory. Um, or, you know, if you are not in the art department, then you should not uh, have uh, uh, you know, large JPEGs, JPEGs over a certain size. You need to be in a film class in order to be allowed to store uh, Windows Media uh, files in your home directory. So again, we'll go through and say these file types aren't allowed, but because we're policy-based, we can easily add exceptions in there. 
So it's a you know real important thing. So again, you can sort of take back control over your storage, and instead of just allowing everybody to do whatever they want, or just saying I'm going to apply a quota and having a bunch of outset users saying I filled it up, let's be a little bit smarter about our storage, and we can do that. That whole life cycle is managed until eventually that person leaves for whatever reason. At which case we can say we're going to delete their information completely, or we may actually put it into a temporary holding area that we call a vault and say you know what. When students leave, we don't want to delete home directories right away. We need to keep them for 30 days, just in case for some reason we need to go and refer to it. And then after 30 days, now let's automatically clean this up. All right, so that whole life cycle is all being driven. You know, the slide says it's starting off with an HR system, but again, that could very easily be, you know, a student management system, Skyward, PowerSchool, all these other uh, ones that are out there. A banner could be driving this. <coughs> So with that, you know, I've really talked about you know a couple of pieces here with file reporter, with storage manager, and uh, what I'd say is that you know there is a third piece. We're not going to really talk about it a whole lot, but that's uh, the in the novel DFS that you see this in here, dynamic file uh, services for Windows. And I'll quickly just touch on it. But I didn't have a lot of information about it just because it'd be a little too much to try to cram into the uh, time that we have here today. Um, but essentially, it's not just moving stuff around or governing your data. You know, we're not just reporting, but if we want to actually relocate and tier your data, we can do that. Uh, so that way, you know, I can, for instance, say if you've got files that haven't been modified in more than a year, automatically move them to a second tier of storage that is less expensive than my primary storage. So we've got a, a you know a few options there. Um, so with that, I know I've just glossed over that, but I want to be cognizant of time because what I really want to do is actually show this stuff because I think demo is where it really gets cool. But maybe I'll, I'll pause just to see if there are any questions. So I don't see any questions in the chat window. Uh, Mary, let me just ask you to make sure that I'm understanding that correctly. Are you yep. seeing the same thing? There are no questions at this point. Please chat your questions if you have them. Well, what I think I'll go ahead and do is flip this uh, sharing over so I can share my desktop. So hopefully I'm going to do this right. I'll find out in a second. All right. Mary, can I confirm you're able to see my screen okay? Yep. Yep. All right, great. And uh, uh, Mary, if I okay, don't mind leaning on you for uh, just another moment, if you do see something pop up in the chat window since I can't really see that right now, would you mind just uh, shouting out at me? Will do. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, so I've got the, this. Will will illustrate the storage manager piece. I also want to also show some of the reporting stuff. So why don't we start off with that as well? So I've got my browser up here. Let me log into Novell File Reporter just to give a quick taste. Again, you know, we could we could spend hours on either one of these products, uh, just going through and and highlighting stuff in detail. But just to give a, an idea here, File Reporter, as I mentioned, allows us to go and get insight in your environment. Very easy to set up. It's a fairly simple installation, at which point we'll go ahead and just start saying, hey, what are all the different uh, shares or volumes we want to scan? And so you can see in here I'm actually scanning both uh, Microsoft servers as well as Novell servers. So I've got Windows, those shares on Windows 2008 R2, and I've also got Network 6.5 and Open Enterprise Server 11 out there. So yeah, yeah I, I like to show that just to really illustrate the fact that you know, we, we really um, support heterogeneous environments, and you know we don't really care. We're agnostic. So at the end of the day, if you're all Microsoft, all Novell, or a mixture, uh, we'll be able to go ahead and support all those types of environments. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and again talk about some of the reports that are out there. I've got a number of reports that I've defined in here, you know, and I'm not going to bore everyone by saying, let's look at this report. Let's look at this report. You know. Um, we could definitely do stuff on a, a one-off basis. But to give you an idea of some of the things that we can do is, for instance, let's talk about the permission stuff. I really want to dive right into that because I think that's very um, important these days, and especially you know, if you start talking about allowing users anytime, anywhere access to their files, like with Filer that we'll talk about on Friday, that means potentially even having more exposure to those files. So you don't want to inadvertently allow a student to have access to a a teacher's home directory or something like that. So how we can go in and, and see if that's happened. Well, let's say you've, you've heard that there's been a breach. So in this case, Amanda Cox, we think there might be an issue going on with Amanda. So I'll just click on the little preview button, and uh, I can see right away all the different folders and shares that Amanda has rights to. 
So I can go out there and see there. So some of the shares themselves, and those have that S designation. Let me know those are shares, and then I can see there's other uh, areas that uh, Amanda has access to. And some that's because of the fact that everyone group has access. There's things that are specifically to Amanda. So let me go out there specifically to Amanda, and we can see a lot more information there. Now, so this report is actually pulling an AD user. It would look a little differently if I was pulling this uh, for an eDirectory user since the permissions look different in a, a Novell world. But then you can see Amanda has a lot of direct assignments out there. Maybe that's a good thing, but maybe that's a bad thing. Um, I may actually determine, you know what, that's, that's a problem, and uh, Amanda shouldn't have all of these direct rights. And I'm kind of scrolling back and forth here. Just want to get to the next page. So here I wanted to highlight some of the indirect ones. So that's actually showing us that it's coming from a group. So in one case, uh, a marketing folder. Another one's a sales folder. And so you go, and that's the nice thing is I'm not just showing you that that group has access. You know, I can I can show you uh, that Amanda's got access by way of that group. So again, we're going to start to give you a lot of that insight so that you know if if you have a suspicion something's going on, let's verify this person truly can access maybe some of this information and see where it's coming from. Then on the flip side, that was a user. As I mentioned, I can do that with uh, a uh, folder. So I've got, you know, again, this could be in, a, in admissions where there's financial aid information, or whatever, and it's a finance folder. And I can go out there and again take a look at who's able to access this folder. So we can see some of the built-in groups are out there, and then I can also see there's a lot of users that have access. Where are they getting it from? One user is a member of IT administrators. Another one is part of the help desk. So there are a number of different users who all have access to this finance data. Well, if that's good, I mean, if they're supposed to have rights, hey, fine, I'm not worried. But if I know that, you know, if I look in this list and I see E. Brown, uh, and I say, well, they're getting it from IT help desk, but I know this person's not part of the help desk, then I'm going to start to, you know, research that a little more and see why has that happened. So again. Very uh, real important thing that you know not a, a lot of folks always think about, especially in the academic environment. They're thinking, well, you know, we're we're not the Department of Defense, we don't have to worry about things. But at the end of the day, um, it is still very important to get an idea of you know, who can access what in uh, an academic setting, right? And that, those are just you know a couple quick samples. You know, there's a lot of other stuff you can see. Some of these are, are custom reports. Like at one point, I said, hey, show me all files that are. Uh, older than five years old, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things I can do. So if I go out there, look, I can see 2009 uh, has almost 300 meg of files. In other words, uh, files that were modified in 2009. So if I want to go out there and actually look at, you know, how, what some of this older data that's out there, I can. Um, 1992 is a little suspect, so someone may have been playing around with the tool as far as trying to say when that was last modified. But again, a lot of insight that I can do. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I want to go ahead. And uh, you know, show you really where we can do a lot of magic with performing actions on all of this data that's out there. I at least wanted to, to highlight that piece. You know, and I guess you know, as I go from one uh, product over to the next, the thing to keep in mind with this too is that um, you know, if there's concerns too about are all home directories set up properly, do everyone ha does everyone have the correct permissions and stuff like that? That's another thing is I could take Storage Manager in here, and you'll see how I'm able to manage home directories. But if I drop into an existing environment, one of the nice things I can do is leverage it to clean up what's there. So it's not like when I go ahead and, and put these solutions into an existing environment that all I can do is manage stuff going forward, but I can retroactively go back and actually fix problems that may be out there. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and, and show Storage Manager. Cause I think uh, let me do a time check. We have we have about 15 minutes, Mary. Yep, you're doing fine on time. Okay, thank you. All right, so I wanted to spend a, a little bit more time within the uh, the storage manager aspect and and highlight you know some of those pieces that we're able to go ahead and do with this. So what I'm going to do before I show the storage manager side, I should show you the interface of of you know how this is all defined because I talk about policies. Let me just create some users, move some users, delete users, so you can see storage manager doing things, and then I'll show you how that's happening. So. Uh, with that, let's go out here. I've got just a you know a fictional district, school district 42, 
and they've got an AD in infrastructure set up here that go. That's in addition to some of the other structure I've got out there. So let me go into this uh, middle school area, and I'm going to create someone. And actually, before I do, let me also have this folder up showing you where those folders are. You'll see this folder is being created, so I don't want you to think it's smoke and mirrors. So you see, I've got two home directories or home folders out there right now for for Jack Byron and, and Coley O'Brien. I am really happy. 24 is back, by the way. I'm so excited. And uh, anyways, but let me go ahead and create a new user, and then you're going to see what happens on the back end with this. So let me create someone, let's say Billy Madison, whose login is just B Madison. Give Billy a password. Say his password never expires. So good. So I haven't done anything you know, extravagant. All I've done is created a user. Now I've done it mainly just because for the purposes of a demonstration, you know, it's the easiest way to do it. But, you know, with me talking about identity management earlier, this is something that could have been automated, right? So if you uh, uh, had identity manager in there or some sort of identity management solution, you could actually say, you know, I'm going to point to the student management system or to the ERP, see that this is a new student that just came into the district, and go ahead and provision this uh, account within AD and put it in the correct container based upon the grade level this person's at and whatnot. And so what's happening then in the background is I've got a you know that engine is running, it's taking a look, it's monitoring Active Directory to see, you know, are there any changes that are occurring? Has someone been added, deleted? And it's really it's event based, so it's going in, in real time and running now with my you know little VM here, sometimes there's a, a little bit of lag just because of, of system resources and stuff in, in this demo environment. So you can see here, you know, I've been talking for just a moment or two since creating Billy Madison, and now I can see there's that home directory, which is neat. But it's not just creating a home directory, but if I look in here, you can see I've actually got some data that's been pre-staged. So I can see in this case there's a group-wise quick reference card that's out there. There's also a policies folder which has, you know, acceptable use policy, and internet policy. So the point is it's not just to create that directory. But, you know, we can go ahead and initially drop in content that you want out there. Now whether or not you want the acceptable use policy out there, you know, it's up to you, but it is kind of nice knowing that that little piece of paper raises signs that they never actually read. If you want them to have, you know, electronic copy, let's automate that through Storage Manager. Okay. So that's the first step. All right, so that's cool that you know Billy has been created in the middle school. Now let's show what happens. So you know Billy uh, has gone ahead and, and graduated uh, from middle school, and he is going to go to high school. So let's move Billy to high school here, and I've got a user's container out there. All right, so Billy Madison is now over there. You can see along with a couple other high schoolers. Now in this case, you know, and you'll see that when I get a policies, I've got different policies for middle school versus high school saying, you know, where your home directory needs to be. Uh, and and so we're going to actually take some actions here based upon that. Again, it's going to take just a moment because of the fact that I've got my uh, my Windows uh, workstation here, my laptop with IBM, but you can see it's kicked in here. That user is gone. And if I go now to high school, the user's there. Just if anyone is curious, by the way, it's a little technical thing. It's not truly a move. It's a copy, then a delete, and we don't actually delete that source until we verify that that copy is complete successfully. So we do have some safety checks in there to make sure this happens correctly. The other thing, and, and since there wasn't hardly any data in there, you didn't see it, if it was something that's going to take a while, though, it would be easier to see, is during that copy process, we actually take the source directory and we rename it. So that way when the user logs in, if they were to get a drive mapping or something that tries to go to their home directory, it's going to fail and they won't get access. That way we just make sure they're not in there use, doing stuff uh, while we're trying to move their home directory. So with that, you can see that information was preserved. But notice how we have a new file out there, a, a Filer quick reference card. So I'm going to talk about Filer. And uh, so that was dropped out there as well because I've got different policies again, middle school and high school. High school says, you know what, you get the filer quick reference car versus middle school getting the other one. So I basically preserved all that data that was there. I moved it, and then the policy says there's some new data that needs to be staged in there. And because it's not there already, I'm going to add it in. Another thing you can notice here is the timestamps. I don't know if anyone has picked that up on the files. You know, they're saying March 4th uh, of 2014. So again, we preserve the timestamps for all this as well. We'll preserve all that metadata uh, so that we can make sure that you know we don't mess anything up, especially from a backup perspective of just trying to look at change files and stuff. We're going to preserve all that information, which is real nice. Now, Billy Madison, 
you know, he's graduated. He's going to become a hotel uh, magnet. So we'll uh, go ahead and just uh, delete him out of here. Let's delete Billy Madison. And we're going to see that home directory move. I'm going to get another Explorer window because I'm going to show you another area where it's going to go to. So you guys may recall, I briefly mentioned temporary staging area that we call a vault that we can move stuff to. And again, it's all on your policy if you want to just delete right away when a user goes away or if you want them to be moved into that sort of temporary area for a period of time, then eventually go away. Um, in my policy though, I say I want to actually vault this user. So if I go out to user vault, I've got a vault for a high school. And in fact, Billy's already there, so I'm guessing he's gone from here and he is. And when I go out there, I can see it's all of Billy's files. So again, it's a real nice thing to note is that you no longer have to have that issue with the end of the, the spring term having to find a way to clean everything up or anything like that. Or the other nice thing you can do with this, just to give you an idea, let's say you find out that there's some sort of investigation that's going to begin against a student that may have been involved in some sort of legal activity or something. I could do something like this. I could say I have a group out there in AD and e or E directory called Legal Hold. Make this user member of the Legal Hold group, and when that happens, their home directory automatically moves to an area that you know some sort of forensic team or whoever within the the uh, the organization within the school will need to go in and take a look at their information. We can actually move that off into that area um, because we see that there's a, a temporary legal hold that's been placed on it. So a lot of a lot of real cool stuff, and just to then quickly highlight how I do this, because I always like to kind of show that home directory life cycle, and again, that's just a very small piece. We didn't really talk about grooming quotas, things like that, because again, kind of short on time for showing you everything. But just to give me an idea of how policy, uh, to how Storage Manager looks with its policies, so you've got a bunch of different policies that are out there, and again, this demo you know encompasses you know this sort of hypothetical academic environment. I've got a hypothetical kind of commercial environment that it's all being managed. But essentially the two policies that I, I worked with today, um, which you saw in there, was middle school home folders and high school home folders. In fact, what I should have probably illustrated too as I was doing this is the fact that quotas were actually changing as the user went from middle school to high school. Um, so if I go and look at this middle school policy, all this information is in there. I'm not going to go through everything, but just you know, a couple of key areas go and tell it who to associate with. So there's that user's container under the middle school OU. I'm saying anyone that's in that user's container, let's do it. But again, if I wanted to, I could do it on a group basis. So for instance, maybe all the middle school users get sort of a default policy, but I want to have exceptions for some teachers or something, in which case I actually do a policy associated to a group, and that group would then override this. Um, so I've got that. Uh, the other couple of things to highlight, when I you know, pre-staged that data, got the acceptable use policy, the internet policy in there. That's all just defined in it. It's a very simple template folder. I just throw the content in that folder and any new user that's created will get that content. And say where to create that user. Neat thing about this, by the way, is if let's say it doesn't always have to go in a specific share or volume or whatever. Say, you know, you have like three different shares that are for our home directories that are all coming off of three different servers because uh, you've got everything centralized back in, in the main location in a district office or whatever. I can go through this and actually say, you know what, I've got three different folders that you can create them on. I don't really care uh, which of them you use. Let's go ahead and just say whichever one has the most free space right now. Put it there, right? So I'm no longer having to manage trying to distribute that. Um, and then uh, one of the last things I want to highlight is that cleanup. So like I said, I can choose what, how to clean it up if I want to clean up at all. So with this, I'm going to vault it immediately, and then after 30 days, then I'm going to actually clean up that vault and get rid of it. All right, and then you know I mentioned some grooming. I actually do have some grooming rules. I didn't have any MP3s in there. However, had I tried to put MP3s in there, that I could have actually forced the grooming rule to happen immediately. Otherwise, normally this would go on a scheduled basis. So once a night, once a week, however often you want, let's look for, in this case, MP3s. And if we find them, we're going to go ahead and just delete them. I could choose to vault them. I could choose to you know do something else, but in this case, delete them. So a very simple policy. Middle school is a policy, and then a high school policy, and they're almost all the same. The only difference is the association. Instead of going to the middle school users, uh, I'm going to associate with the, the high school users. Right. So the only difference that uh, I need to do out there. One last thing, I know we're getting a little low here, but I do want to highlight one more. So that's a home director manager that's, co that's cool, but one more real interesting thing is what we call collaborative storage, and I want to highlight that as well. 
So, you know, if let's say each class wants to have their own space, right, that, uh, that teachers can hand out assignments like place in folders, students maybe get their own personal space to work on folders and stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you want to even maybe out for like a sort of homework drop box for someone. We can do that very easily with Storage Manager. So let me just show you what I'm, I'm doing here, and then I'll, I'll highlight it in the file system so you get kind of a better understanding of what I'm talking about, because this is very powerful, and we find a lot of academic customers are interested in this. So let me go ahead and just create a brand new group. And actually, you know, I hate to kind of go back and forth, but as I do this, let me show you that I don't have anything existing for this group but I will when it's done. Those are those two groups that are out there already, 6th grade English, 7th grade math. But I'm going to create a new one. And let's just say 8th um, grade uh, algebra, if I can spell algebra. There we go. Created a group. Now let's go ahead and, and do a couple of additional things here to this group. Let me make someone a member of it. So now let's go to those middle school users. I think I've got uh, Jack Bauer, let's make him a member of the group. And then let's say that a Chloe is the actual no, well, who was that user? I may have misspelled. Let me take a look. Who was the uh, I think I may have typed that wrong. Chloe is the teacher, so we want to add a Chloe. And I uh sometimes struggle a little bit with a D. So, sorry about this, everyone. Let me try one more time. And what am I doing? It oh, helps if I do the right tab. That's why it's not. Sorry, everyone. I didn't even pay attention where I was. There we go. That's what I'm trying to say. Chloe is the teacher, so she's the one that manages this group. She's the manager of it. And then you've got Jack Bauer, who is a member of the group. There we go. And uh, and so the whole concept, like I said, again, is to have this sort of shared space so that everyone kind of collaborate with each other on their files. And so if I go back out here to classes, you can see before I only had the two, so a new one was created. Again, it's just a policy. The policy says, hey, if you create a group in this container, go ahead and create a folder that's got the same name as that group. So that's eighth grade algebra. And you can see here I've got a homework Dropbox. No one has permissions to it other than to create files. So that's a nice thing. They can't see what's out there. They can't see the other student's home homework, but they can go ahead and drop information off. But if I look under the students folder, there's Jack Bauer. So he's got his own personal area. So all the students can collaborate. That's all on how you want to set this up. So I could say, I've got my own space. I can do stuff in it. Everyone else can see it. So they could go in and grab a file from my folder but they're not going to go out and be able to delete that content, modify that content, things like that, if that's what you want to do. So we can allow the students to work together, you know, if this is maybe more of a project than just for the entire class. And then the actual uh, instructor, Chloe in this case, just quickly show that when I go to security and scroll down. And there, Chloe, you can see because I made her the manager of that group in AD to designate she's the teacher, she also then got full permissions right there to that folder. And then if I looked at the subfolders, I would see she's getting it and it's just inheriting from this top level. So again, real quick introduction. But the home directory stuff I like to show because that's a problem everybody has. This is kind of taking storage almost to the next level by having this group collaborative storage that, again, not everyone thinks about. But it is a, uh, a very popular thing that we see with a, a lot of academic customers. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause for a second. I guess, Mary, have there been any questions? Nope. We are still without questions. Okay. So either I'm really good or I really bored everyone. <laughs> <laughs> One of the two. Um, but that's that's it. That's at least the uh, initial um, introduction there. And then I guess, uh, so Mary, does um, with the email blast that went out or with some of the follow-up, the survey, will it include my contact information at all? Um, I will send out the slides, and I will include that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So yeah, uh, if any of you have any questions or like any follow-up, anything like that, like I said, feel free to leverage uh, me. Reach out to me. Um, you'll have that contact info with what Mary sends out. And um, as part of that, you know, we're part of a whole uh, sales team here at, at Novell. Plenty of other SEs and salespeople. So depending upon where you are, I may go ahead and put you in touch with some of your more local resources. But um, anything please reach out to me. But other than that, thank you very much. 
Thanks, Joe. This has been great content. Uh, thanks, folks, for joining us today. On Friday at 1030, Joe will be back with us again for managing the mobile tidal wave. So if you have uh, not signed up for that and would like to join us, please do so. Uh, also, please be sure to give us your feedback in our survey at the conclusion of this call. Thanks, and have a great day.